Welcome to a, another afternoon live stream on a Friday, live from Greater Westminster. We are still here. We're still going. <laughs> this is Becky. This is Constantine, just in case you didn't know who we were. Um, as some of you know, and some of you have commented, yes, London is now locked down, so you cannot come into the shop, but we can come to work, so you can still buy stuff from us. We just have to send it out to you, uh, or click and collect, which you can still do. So don't worry, never fear, you can yeah. still get your Nikon fix um, for the duration of the next month. Uh, and then let's see how it goes. And let's see, exactly, let's see how it goes. Um, we have... Another giveaway this week. Since you loved it last time. It was so much fun to give away something last week that we thought, why not do it again? That's Th right. This is courtesy of Constantine. He is the, the vinyl connoisseur in the shop. So you have to say a big thank you to Constantine if you win. Um, I'm not going to sign it for you. No. <laughs> unless you ask. <laughs> Could you ask nicely? <laughs> so... Con, tell us about this album before we dive into the topic at hand today. Absolutely. So real quick, if you've got a record player and you like a bit of jazz, uh, this is a must-have album. It's called Something Else. And it's by uh, Kenan uh, Bo Adley, um, who was a sax player. And it features Miles Davis on it. It came out in 1959. It's considered to be one of the kind of top 10 jazz albums in the world. So if you'd like to win one, what do you have to do, Becky? Uh, you just have to type in the comments, I want to win because, and then put your reason. Because it could literally be because you feel like it or because you want to listen to it next week <laughs> yeah. your suddenly matter. i've got a lot of spare time <laughs> and i want to listen to some jazz music exactly yeah. so we will um pick a winner out of a box or a hat um at the end of the stream so feel free to pop your comments in it's a fm2 box there yeah. you go you can see yeah. that <laughs> that's um, the box that we're gonna put them. and next week we're gonna give away a little mix vinyl <laughs> Since we just decided to change it up a little bit, now we're not going we to do that. I don't think anyone um, here owns a little mix vinyl, but there we go. Uh, so I'm just making sure that I've got, yes, I've got the comments up and running. And um, for some people, it's a bit chilly and sunny. It is very chilly in London, but we don't mind. Yeah. It's okay. It's been quite foggy this morning, wasn't it? It has. It's a good reason to stay indoors and watch a live stream, I think. Um, don't forget, you can subscribe button on that side uh you can also contribute to the coffee fund also down below uh and if you can't contribute live and you want to contribute later then you can use the paypal me link so thank you to anyone who does i still didn't get my widget up so i'll just keep an eye if you um if you contribute i will pay attention to what's going on still one that will got deck yes we, we do yeah. we do um makes my life easier <laughs> <laughs> so today we are talking about a few people had said can you do something on the D3 or the D4? And I kind of thought, well, we can't really do a whole stream about the D3 or the D4, but um, we could do a stream about all of the, the professional bodies. The flagships. <laughs> the, all the flagship Nikon D cameras. So that's what we've uh, decided to do today. So we, I wanted to call it 20 years of Nikon Digital. It's actually a little bit more than that um, because Nikon did that kind of... Um, what did they do? A collaboration with Fuji back in 1995. They did that, no, with Kodak as well. That was for the F5. Yes, no, but they also, what Kodak used to do, they used to make bags for different manufacturers, including Nikon as well. Yeah. And there was one for F80, I think there was one for F90X, mm -hmm. uh, the one for F5 as well. Yeah. Um, but they also did for some other manufacturers, but they call it collaboration. Basically. Yeah, so. exactly. And then they produced uh, a camera called the E2, and they did also do an E3, uh, which was in combination with Fuji. So it said Nikon on the top, and then it said Fuji on the side. Um, that was a very small sensor digital camera, but that was their first kind of, I would say, entry into it. There's actually a very cute little video on the Nikon Corporation website about the history of the of the D cameras uh, which is about three minutes long it's worth watching just because it's kind of it's intriguing how it started interestingly enough so the E2 came out and then the mm -hmm. E3 came out shortly after mm -hmm. but they found it was uneconomical in terms of both expenditure and also mm -hmm. in terms of usability so they gave themselves nikon gave themselves three years to mm -hmm. make an, an slr style mm -hmm. digital camera and they managed to do it in two years that's right um and came out with the d1 in 1999 that's so right. um that back to the thing not including the e-series yes i've just yeah. done my little explanation on that now <laughs> so yes include the e-series i'm kind of brushing over that one yeah. just because you know it was 
it was groundbreaking at the time, but the real mm. groundbreaking camera, I think, was the D1, yeah. wasn't it? The problem with manufacturing digital cameras at the time was they could manufacture the sensor, but the battery to power it, well, they couldn't uh, create a battery small enough to power the digital sensor. Right. But they also have to have a storage separately. So you effectively end up some sort of tethered type of camera uh, yes. where you have a cable, power cable going out of it and, well, cable for the data. Mm. So it wasn't very practical or usable, I guess only for kind of studio work and type like copy type of work yeah i mean certainly not on a consumer level you wouldn't exactly. be able to use that you wouldn't be able to carry that around and take it that's true and then holiday. when we discussed last week with f6 where they tried to experiment with a hybrid camera mm. first and then they decided again it wasn't very practical so again div1 development comes out of that yeah. so they've started in 1996 yeah and kind of the major hurdle was is actually to create a battery yeah small enough to power the camera so that took them two years to develop and Interesting. And they also, because they couldn't kind of um, estimate uh, the demand for the camera, they couldn't actually find the manufacturer to produce the sensor. So that was another thing. The Kodak was a kind of a dominant player in that space in the 90s. Yes. Um, I think the F80, it's called SCS 460 or something like this camera, costs about $28,000. Good Lord. <laughs> so not cheap, not even medium format. So, um, But uh, they were kind of dominant in that space. And then when D1 came out, and mm. it came out at $5,000, a piece that was kind of the first camera that kind of threatened Kodak in that space. Interesting. It's funny, Baxter says the PCM CIA card, if memory serves, was that the E series that took that? Um, because the D1 took a compact flash card, mm -hmm. didn't it? In fact, I was asking Simon Stafford about this. He's very um, kindly provided a few photos just as samples to show you what he shot with the D1X, I think it was at mm -hmm. the time. Um, he did all of his shots from the Nikon compendium book that he mm -hmm. put together, uh, which Gray has a copy of up in his office, but I, I don't have my own copy of that. But anyway, all the pictures were done on the D1X um, and it came with a Nikon branded eight megabyte memory card eight megabytes <laughs> which probably was like hundreds of pounds <laughs> to manufacture thousand pounds yeah. per card yeah exactly in fact i remember having a 128 megabyte usb stick in my mm -hmm. off in my old job and it was it cost about 150 quid for a, for a few megs so anyway and here we're now <laughs> thinking in terabytes yeah, as a normal exactly. stage i think the I think they're about 20 terabyte hard drive either coming out at the end of this year or beginning of next one. Wow. 20 terabytes That's of a hard drive. That's good if you've got D850 or a Z7. It's not bad. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so the, the cards also, they managed to make a storage type that was readily available, which was the compact flash card system. Um, and that continued until very recently, actually. Compact flash cards obviously are still available. So, so if you think about technology, someone was asking me, someone got very upset when I said, as they do, uh, we on the internet. <laughs> when I said that CF cards were kind of, let's say old technology, because now we've got XQD cards and SD cards and you can make them smaller and smaller at higher capacities and more robust. Mm -hmm. And you don't have that pin system, which That's right. then ends up, you know, bent pins and all kinds of complications. Yeah, I think XQD format and CF Express uh, format this kind of evolution of CF card. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And the CFs, they even had a D5 version, which was CF version. Yeah, that's right. You can so, request it. That's um, right. And that was the, kind of the last camera that used it. Exactly. So um, if I upset anyone by saying CF was old technology, I've just, just put it in perspective that the D1 had uh, CF card slots as well. Um, I do remember using floppy disks official mainspring. I remember using oh, yes. telexes. <laughs> they had, a, I think, 3.5 and 5.25 disks. Yeah, floppies. yeah, exactly. I remember continuously corrupting floppy disks and being very annoyed by that. Anyway, for anyone that's like under the age of, I'd say, 25, yeah. you probably don't know what we're talking about. If any of you played Doom, the original Doom, I, I think it came on like five or six floppies yeah. at the time, and you, <laughs> you had to do that. Or you could have a cassette. Oh, really? And uh, you would have to wait for about 10 minutes for it to load, and it would be like a dial up modem sound. Oh, wow. You know, that would be that. But that's, that's so before cool. even PC. Yeah. <laughs> so, this has become a video game, retro video game stream. <laughs> so, um, so, PS5 is coming up. Yeah. Anyway, we digress. Um, so, D1, D1X, D1H, they did a high speed version. That's right. So, and a high res version. That's true. So they came out at 2.7 megapixels. That was First the D1 of all, the, the original D1, the oh, original the D1. D1. Okay, so yeah. 2.7 megapixels. Okay. 4.5 frames per second. Wow. And two inch low resolution screen. Two inch. Imagine like really... having the, one yeah. of those phones yeah, that had yeah. a tiny, tiny screen. Yeah. So that had that. And 
the funny thing about it, actually, it's used not the sRGB or Adobe RGB that we are kind of accustomed to, the color space. It's actually used NTSC color space, which was really strange. Wow. And another fun fact about this is it had a 16,000th of a second shutter speed. So all cameras nowadays are used 8,000th of a second. Yes. And also 500th uh, of a second sync speed, flash sync speed. And that's wow. done with the use of electronic shutter. So, oh, interesting. That's like really... I didn't know that, you know, 16,000th of a second. I was actually going to switch over, if I can remember the shortcut. There we go. Um, that is the back of a D1. So this is Simon Safford's picture. Actually shot on a D1X for the, mm -hmm. the Nikon Compendium book. But it's just interesting to see. You can see where the evolution of our cameras have come about. Like if mm -hmm. you compare it to, if I just open up the door there... <laughs> you can kind of see the evolution of that, can't you? It's not that dissimilar, in fact. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, coming back to G1X and G1H, yeah. the G1X has 5.3 megapixel sensor. So, and G1H had the same 2.7 frames per sec uh, megapixel, but at 5 frames per second, so 3 frames per second on G1X. Right, so the, the X was kind of considered the high res version high res studio kind of fashion you know kind of you know advertising 5.3 megapixels. megapixels wow huge i think that at the time that's probably what my old that's what the iphones have now is like the old iphones have yeah. the standard kind and of now there's like eight or yeah. ten megapixels or so quite a lot of resolution at the time now you know we've got 45 megapixel sensors other brands have up to 60 or 100 megapixel sensors so and this is i'm um, just because simon's got the photos here so these are d1x shots so these would have been shot at 5.3 megapixels uh which is kind of interesting but it was bit it was good enough for print quality at the time if you look this is actually this top plate view that's very similar to mm -hmm. what we see at the moment and um then just as a picture that was done for the book this is a picture taken on a d1x that's a so. scrapped prototype <laughs> So they, yeah, <laughs> yeah, didn't no, happen. classic, classic cameras. So there we go. So that just gives you some some samples. There. Yeah, there was they had the D1R in development. Then R stands for retro. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, so just I'm actually just wondering if anyone's got any questions on these. Uh, Charles Robin says my first CF card was like a mini hard drive with a moving disc inside. Can't remember what it was called. Oh, interesting. Um, don't forget about the rectangular photo sites on the sensor of the D1 mm. series. Yeah, so it was uh, the sensor had... I think it had 10.8 million photo sites and then they grouped them to produce 2.7 megapixel image. I've read right. it somewhere. Um, right. Don't quote me on that, but yeah. There you go. Um, what we saw, kind of the major things that we saw, first of all, obviously the DX sensor size introduction. So the size was 23.7 by 15.6 centimeters. Mm. So what we currently call a DX kind of type of setup. Uh, to produce a full frame camera at the time would be too expensive. Yeah. So Nikon didn't see it viable well as all other manufacturers. Mm -hmm. So we saw the first development in DX space and then later on when we went to, towards D3, kind of they moved on to full frame. Yeah. But uh, DX sensor type introduction and the raw format, so Nikon NEF raw format. So, yeah, which has now become kind of like our standard. Everyone shoots yeah. on raw. We have NEF files. Um, thank you very much. Sorry. Thank you very much, Terry, for your thank contribution you, to the coffee fan. I've just spotted that there. That's fantastic. Thank you. And Drazen um, says that he needs to go out and pick some mushrooms. Uh, I'm assuming for lunch or dinner. So fine. We'll see you later, Drayton. <laughs> uh, so in terms of the jump from, because the D1, D1H, so the D1 came out in 99, mm -hmm. D1X came out in 2001. So two uh, years. Alongside the D1H. So they did both cameras side by side in 2001. And then it was two years again before we saw the uh, D2H, which was again a high speed Body, right so they tend to concentrate on the high speed bodies as the well originally it was the h series and then it lost the h and then the x were like the high mm -hmm. high resolution ones if you like so the d2h what do you know what the main differences were well we we saw improvement as with all the products they they be so improvement in autofocus speed of course yeah. uh we saw the improvement in resolution so we jumped to 4.1 megapixels mm -hmm. at eight frames per second um, I think there could be a larger screen as well, or it could be a higher resolution screen at the time. Have, so, it was slightly bigger yeah. than the D1 screen. That's true. And it was yeah. slightly more centralized, mm -hmm. wasn't it? So um, they changed the button layout. So the buttons went to uh, what we're used to seeing now, where you have 
the buttons on this side, screen in the middle. It was a little screen still, it wasn't that big, but yeah. Um, and then they had D2X. And then the D2X was the high speed, no, sorry, no. the full resolution. Kind of studio camera, yeah. again, advertisement and all that. So 12 megapixels. Which was revolutionary. At the time, yeah. It reminds me of G800, 136 for, uh, megapixels yeah, for the first like, release. That was huge. <laughs> Um, 12 megapixels, um, yeah. and obviously because of that it was a little bit on the noisier side compared to um, D2H. Yes. Uh, and it had, because of the large amount of data, it had low frames per second. So um, that one went to 5 frames per second. Right, so they dropped a few frames to add a bit more resolution. Um, but ultimately the D2X, I think, has, in a lot of ways it's kind of withstood the test of time. Mm -hmm. Because I still know fashion photographers who up until very, very recently were shooting with yeah. D2Xs. It, the only caveat I would say with these older bodies is that you can't get them serviced anymore, not easily anyway. Um, so it becomes expensive to keep them running if things go wrong. Also, obviously you've got the limitations of the of the cards because the compact flash cards, um, even the larger ones don't mm -hmm. work. The D2X would work with um, eight gig, I think is, or four yes. gig is the yes, biggest, four it's about gig. that. So, you now actually will struggle to find cards small enough to fit in there and when people bring us in older bodies and they say hi can you check the number of actuations mm -hmm. on this camera we don't always have cards that are compatible because the cards are now too big for those older bodies and the also interesting bit is that d2x was the first nikon camera that uses cmos sensor, right, uh, sensor yeah. instead of ccd yeah so d200 at the time still had a ccd sensor uh, which a lot of medium format ca cameras at the time used yeah. and the CMOS type of sensor sensor we well see nowadays really yeah so exactly. they've still, still been used that very technology. Much a current sensor yeah. um, and then they did a D2XS didn't they? Yes. D2HS and D2XS so again two year upgrade cycle so they came out in 2000 and well, um, 2005 for 2005. the HS and then 2006 for the XS so literally yeah. two years apart for each one um, and again, those were, I mean, we tend to see with the S models, sort of incremental changes. Yeah, version 2.0 of, of the camera. So yeah. kind of lots of quality of life improvement, but nothing that's been standing out. So the resolution yeah. is still the same. Exactly. The sensor tends to be the same. Yeah. But... Frame rate, the mm -hmm. same, um, but they improved their, um, well, overall kind of uh, responsiveness of the camera. Mm -hmm. It was a slightly bigger screen, uh, better viewfinder. Yeah. Uh, and overall better performance. Yeah, and there were a few other things like being able to connect it to Camera Control Pro 2 at the time, being able to use wireless transmitters or improved compatibility with wireless transmitters. At the time it was like the WT-1, I mm. think, was the first first one. So you had these, as, as Con said, quality of life improvements rather than big groundbreaking changes. I like them. Um, Baxter's gone like super geeky on me. D2H has a JFET LB cast, I can pronounce that wrong, <laughs> sensor and a weak infrared filter, which makes for interesting colors fixed in the D2HS. That's mm. good to know. Charles says, um, I had a D2H fantastic camera like a rocket ship compared with my earlier D100. I actually cut my teeth on a Nikon D100. That was my first digital camera. It reminded me. Um... I think it was my first year working here yeah. and we've got the last of brand new D2HSs. I think we've got tw like 20 boxes of them. Oh my goodness. And we were selling them at 995 a piece. Wow. It was kind of like sellout price, you I know, kind of. I remember that. And they literally went like within two days. I bet. Yeah, that was incredible. So, I wonder who, who bought one of those actually. I'd be interested Well, a lot know. of sports photographers who knew the frame rate. Yeah, yeah, they went for that and low light performance at the time was outstanding as well. Yeah. Yeah, for, for that day and age. That's one of the things that I found with Nikon cameras when, I mean, I haven't used loads of other brands. And as you know, I'm not like, I don't secretly have a Canon that I use all the time. And not that I have any problem with it, but I've noticed that um, the low light performance particularly on the Nikon cameras has always tended to have that slight edge mm -hmm. over the Canons, whereas the Canons kind of went down. Yeah. We don't have any other cameras, but we all say Nikon is better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Completely unbiased. Totally unbiased, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, Roy and Terry both also had D100. It's funny, D100 for me was, you know, it had, instead of changing your mode on the top and your ISO by pushing a button and stuff like that, it had this little dial mm. that you would swing around to change things. And anyway, it was very nostalgic. I was then 
my mum who worked at the shop, for some of you that remember Tabitha, um, she got me a D200 as a Christmas present, I think back in 2008. I've started with D200 as and well. And D200 was like, was revolutionary in comparison to the D100. So um, anyway. I but... think we should do a stream on D200. <laughs> we should. Yeah. I just show yeah. you my old photo albums. Yeah. Um, you actually have some pictures that you shot with the D2X. Yes. There. So before we switch, um, we go over to the next one. Bear with so me. Some of the early mm. commercial work that I did okay. and I was studying at college at the, um, at the time so it was a BTEC national diploma in photography so yeah. the, the one that called ping pong yeah ping pong oh lovely so those I did with D2X Very and it was nice. a lovely camera uh, that would shoot amazing shots up to 800 ISO and then would get really really grainy so yeah. really kind of is so 400 ISO is the tops I would ever go with it but for studio type of work it was you know um good enough because you would have plenty of light to leave the subject accordingly but that was one of the first commercial jobs I did those are great and actually you know 12 megapixels is kind of the happy place yes. I would say in terms of resolution so if you're not looking for a low light performer camera yeah. and you're not also printing billboards mm -hmm. well the one with the T yeah uh, the that that was low light and that was yeah that was without any other light as well so it was still possible to take the shots and it's just not easy of, enough you know. you know you can make Maybe if you're being super critical, mm -hmm. you might be able to see a bit of noise in the shadow. But <laughs> I mean, in terms of a usable shot, in fact, I find that that almost has a, a kind of like a film quality. To mm -hmm. it. Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Not, yeah. not um, because of the, the noise necessarily, but just because things are a little bit toned down and a bit more simplified. When D3 came out, we had actually a lot of people saying, well, I still prefer colors from my D2X. Yeah, they than say from that all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Every new camera that comes out. I prefer the colors yeah. from the old camera. I'm going to explain why it's different in a moment, but um, I haven't finished. What the, this set is amazing. Why have I not yeah. seen these photos before? Because um, I'm shy. Yeah. <laughs> you can your stuff more. I love it. So these are all D2X. These are all D2X. Right. Yes. Brilliant. I never shot with the D2X. So D200 was d200 was 10 megapixels mm. it wasn't it? so it was a slightly different sensor yeah. but i was very happy with that sensor. well that, that is one of the perks of working here that you can actually <laughs> borrow equipment sometimes <laughs> so and i if did have i think i did have d200 but d2x was available as, so i thought why not yeah why not take it out for for a for a spin so uh then we had the d3 now the d3 was quite revolutionary I oh would yes say. i mean first full frame Nikon full frame SLR. digital camera um which before had just been far too expensive to produce um i don't know if there was i actually didn't check but were there any other in the sort of main camera companies that were producing a full frame camera at the time well since we don't really prepare for our streams i don't know um <laughs> I don't, but... but i remember because the d3 came out when we started the d3 came out in 2007 i started in 2008 that's right the d3 was the current um, flagship body uh, when I started working here and I remember it being kind of it was like oh Nikon have done a full frame camera this is something different and then the D700 came out quite literally while I was um, yeah cutting my teeth and on... killed all the sales of D3 <laughs> <laughs> well it was like the D3 was this big camera we've got a D3 is that a D3? the D3 yes yeah. okay so this is the next one but in terms of body size the D700 obviously chopped the grip off and um, was otherwise... And made it cheaper. And then was cheaper. <laughs> so the, the D700 and the D3 had the same 12 megapixel sensor. Mm. The D3 um, ha was the first camera, Nikon camera, to have an X-Speed processor in it. That's right. X-Speed processors have become kind of synonymous with excellent low light performance. Um, and also just generally, I mean, the processor is the thing that is responsible for turning your image yeah. into a, into an image, taking that information off the So off it's the like thing. Intel or AMD, but for your camera. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So Nikon doing their own XP processor. This is where um, they really had the edge over a lot of other manufacturers because suddenly their processor was able to cope with very low light um, situations and get rid of a lot of yeah. the noise. And though low light in D3 was amazing, yeah. it was groundbreaking. Yeah, completely. Especially at 12 megapixels. Again, we said D800, D2, D2X yeah. at 800 ISO was quite noisy. That one could shoot at 3200 with still acceptable image quality. And some of the shots, I don't know if you've seen some shots of a kind of London from helicopter yes. at night. You, you wouldn't be able to shoot with film uh, for this type of shots. It no. just w wasn't possible at the time. And the, we we started to, to kind of do some photography that wasn't kind of available to us before. Yeah, I would or say achievable, it way, kind yeah. of, yeah, definitely opened up the door for other 
types of photography, things that you wouldn't have been able to do with film, for example, or that would have been very, very difficult um, with film. Uh, just having a look, had a D300 for an age. Yes, that was 12.3 megapixels. Uh, Nigel still has a D1H, a D2H and a D2HS. Um, and the D2s still work, but don't have a battery for the D1H. The D1s had that big battery. Ian for battery, which Ian was Ian very... Un Ian, Ian 4, Plus yeah, Ian. and you could have MH16 or 17 to uh, to charge it. And they were very unre or unreliable. Well, yeah. I mean, they were reliable at the time, but two, three years down the road, they started to lose their charge. So therefore, you can't really buy... Uh, one of the old ones and just keep using it like you would do with D2s or D3s nowadays. Yeah, exactly. And the D2s were the ones that incorporated the ENEL 4 battery. D2X had the 4A. 3 and then 3S all used the A's and then with D4 we switched to the 18 That's version right. of the battery. And the reason for that, I'm going to tell you now, fun fact. Yeah. <laughs> Japanese legislation? Yeah, yes. Exactly. So um, obviously we saw, unfortunately, a lot of earthquakes um, and tsunamis, uh, one resulting from the other around sort of 2008, 2009, I think yep, it was. Yep. And the legislation on what kind, what quantity of lithium you could put in batteries changed dramatically um, around that time period. This is why I remember it. It was mm -hmm. very memorable for us because we also then struggled to get certain cameras in stock at the time. Um, and I think they had to lower the voltage of the batteries. They did. It was one of the main things. But the weird thing was, so the D2H battery, like if you pick up an ENL 4A, not a 4, I'd say, but a 4A now, you will find that they will still last for quite a long time. Yeah. The ones that last forever and will probably still be here in a million years' time is the ENL 3Es yes. from the D700. They never wear out, yeah. ever. <laughs> and again, they replace those and yeah. they introduce 15s with a new generation of cameras like 750 or D800. Yeah, and you do see those wear down. I have seen yeah. them wear out over years. Yeah. So, so I think it's... before we continue, yes. um, another plug for the giveaway. Um, just have a little intermission. If you like jazz and you got a record player, you got to have this. Uh, so just yeah. write a comment, say, I want this because I want it. I want and it. It may be yours. I want well, it now. We've got yes. quite a few people who have, I've, um, our producer has got all your names. She's putting them in the box yeah. as we speak, so don't forget to yeah. enter. Thank um, you very much, Robert, for your contribution to you, the Robert. Coffee Fund. Very much appreciated. Um, so, Andy says he's got a D700 and the noise ceiling is uh, around ISO 12,000, sorry, 1250. And that's when the noise hmm. becomes not nice. That's a really yeah. interesting level. To... Everyone is different, isn't it? Yeah. With assessing what's their kind of level. What, so, they, what they find yeah. acceptable. Absolutely. absolutely. I think I found like a yeah, 1600 still usable and then 32 if you have to. Yeah. And then with D4, you could push you Probably could push it. I'm going to show yeah. you some examples in a moment of D4, uh, D4S and D4 being used yeah. at ridiculous levels. I think um, I've got some shots from D3, I think, on my um, on your... page. Yeah. Oh, good. I'm glad that we prepared those. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, J Jared says the Canon 5D was the first. I actually wasn't sure of what the date was on the Canon 5D. Um, so thank you, Jared, for pointing that out. Um, was it really? So the Canon 5D was the first full frame? Could be. Could be. I mean, and a lot of... One were like, yeah. Don't forget us. Here's well, the D3. <laughs> a lot of those technologies have been developed around the same time. Yes, it's true. So you, the one camera may come out a little bit earlier, let's say three, six months earlier. But obviously, these products take ages to develop, years to develop. Yeah. So in terms of this, yes, a lot of those things, um, you know, would come out around the same time, would be developed at the same time. It's like D90 was the first uh, DSLR with video on it, but then 5D Mark II came out yeah. um, a couple months later. And then and, Canon you know. were like, we do video. Yes. <laughs> Everybody yeah. bought the, the Canon cameras if they were doing video work. And obviously, um, the D90 didn't even have autofocus in video. It was a very basic video functionality in a DSLR. But again, it was it was impressive at the time. Interestingly, um, the so when we had one of the designers, Tetsuro Goto, over from mm -hmm. Japan when he was doing his kind of like retirement tour, he said that the the the, the manufacturing companies like Nikon would speak to their, yeah. you know, to the other companies. And they, they talk to each of, other. They talk to each other because you've got engineers, you've got designers, you've got all these different teams and they all have their own kind of thoughts and they will collaborate and then they come together at the end and work out what they're going to put in their cameras. So sometimes you will find overlapping features. And that's why also sometimes you find that one brand does something on yeah. their cameras, which the other brand doesn't because they've 
you know, whoever's designed it at the yeah. time has gone, we don't need that, do we? And then everyone goes, yeah. why didn't you put it in your camera? That's the thing. I think that's why we don't like really those kind of, you know, different brands wars because oh, so pointless. they're all doing good for photography and <laughs> exactly. they're all pushing each other to produce better equipment. Exactly. Um, Baxter says that the 1DS was full frame. I'd have to check, fact check that. We don't know Canon. Canon. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Excuse our ignorance. Um, haven't shot with with a Canon for a very long time. Uh, can we expect a medium format mirrorless camera from Nikon? No, no, they won't go to a medium format sensor. I don't think, um, which is a shame. But at the same time, you know, they've kind of they found their sweet spot. I don't think, unless the whole. Oh, can you? Um, sorry, my battery's not charging. Can you check that my thing's just <laughs> before the stream yeah. ends on a dramatic yeah. note there? Because my. I think the beauty of the market at the moment is that we have manufacturers of full frame cameras, of medium format cameras and of DX cameras, and you can choose whatever equipment you want. And they're all very good. Yes, exactly. So it's, um, although it's very much horses for courses, you don't have to, you know, we, we like Nikon, we've been here for 12 years, um, talking about nothing else. It doesn't make a huge amount of sense. I need to turn my alerts off. Mm. Um, it doesn't make a huge amount of sense to, um, to not, not, plug Nikon, yeah. let's say, yeah. or not use Nikon yeah. cameras. And the thing is, this the, those things, they take time and money to develop as well. And it's not a one-year production, like something like mirrorless. Nikon wasn't the first one in the no. game. They yeah. took their time and they made sure that the, the first generation of products are really good. Yeah. Um, and in terms of this, we have other manufacturers. Well, let's mention Fuji and Hasselblad, and uh, they do fantastic medium format cameras. If you go on a higher budget, you can always go for with phase one. Yeah, exactly. Um, but again, yeah, full frame nowadays is where it's at um, and if you want something small and light you can go with the DX range. Uh, yeah and I, I would also say that in terms of medium format that's not necessarily a consumer level size of yeah. sensor that's medium format is for pro pros but also for studio yeah. photographers or very rich people or, or people <laughs> yeah. who are completely loaded so if you um so if if you look at like the the Nikon kind of strategy of let's produce a camera that lots of people will want to buy mm -hmm. doesn't totally make sense for them to produce a mirrorless camera that's yeah. my logic we would love one but again we are not Nikon and yeah. we are photographers and of course we want new things we, like we love new them shiny toys. exactly um so Andy asked if the D90 was the first live view incorporated in the SLR it was yes. because the video kind of went hand in hand in that which was was very useful so we talked about the D3 then we had the D3X, which came out in 2008. Again, and I'm going to say it again, the quality of life improvements. What? No, but it was also 24 megapixels. No. So, yes, it oh, was. Oh, the X. X. I'm thinking you're talking S. No, the X came out X. Like okay, so this <laughs> is <laughs> this is where all the D800s come from. So, yeah, so this was Nikon's first kind of, ooh, let's put lots of pixels in and see if people want lots yeah. of pixels in our... 24 camera. megapixels at the time was, was a huge. ridiculous amount. That was your studio fine art landscape camera. It was a big camera. I remember selling one of the first ones in the shop. It was like, what, 5,000 pounds? It wasn't cheap. Yeah. It was about five grand. Sounds normal nowadays, 5,000 pounds, yeah, but for a flagship body back in the day, like, yeah. What? And um, I was surprised, shocked, stunned, and a little mm. amazed that, that that would be a camera that a consumer would use. But there were people that yeah. wanted to take them on holiday and, and stuff like that. It was this size. Yeah. Um, it looked literally like D3S or D3 at yeah, the time, but exactly. it had a different sensor. Uh, even today, people swear in by the image quality and color reproduction of D3X. It was quite a, lot... a special... Um, yeah, when D800 came out again, people say, oh no, D3X, completely different color reproduction than D800. And if you like a big camera and that's kind of, you know, that you're used to the flagship bodies, then the D3X had that robustness to it, let's say. Um, another point that because it had more pixels, it wasn't as good in low light as the yeah. D3 and the D3. Very noisy at about 1600 so mm -hmm. that's what would be the ceiling for this camera. Yeah, exactly. Very slow frame rate as well. I think at 14 bit, again, I could be wrong there, but it was something around two frames per second yeah, it was at 14 three. bit. It yeah, was very, very slow. At 12 bit, a little bit faster, I think up to five or something like that. Uh, yes, if you exactly, if you compressed it and then shortly after the D3X, we saw the D3S. So the D3X was. So D3 was 2007, D3X was 2008, and then the D3S was 2009. And some people got confused between the S and the X, but again, the X was 24 megapixels, the S was 12, and was basically an improvement off on the D3, essentially. Yeah, there was a quite a good low light improvement there. Yes, it was. That was the where the kind of 
cat in a coal cellar term mm -hmm. kept coming around. Like people would shoot in pitch black and you'd be able to oh, yeah. see um see the, the subject if you whacked it up to you know twelve and a yeah. half thousand hours. I think so. at that point we start to see with every generation they would say, Well now you can focus at minus two EV and then you can go to minus four EV and minus yeah. six EV, etc. etc. Or they would call it you can focus on moonlight. Yeah. So that's another way. Uh, another technology they kind of started to introduce yeah. with the digital SLR. Exactly, and the and the X speed processors continued to improve. Although those were all X speed at that time, we didn't see X speed three, which was mm -hmm. a gra <laughs> the groundbreaking. What the groundbreaking processor? That's that was in the D four, so that's when we started to see that. Um, just want to say a very quick thank you to Gary for your thank contribution you, to the Coffee Fund. Um, sorry you missed the beginning, but yes, you can catch up later. Absolutely. Uh, Sean says his first pro digital body was the D3X. Amazing camera, still miss it. I find mm -hmm. that's a general consensus with the D3X. So many people really had a kind of something yeah. nostalgic yeah, about Yeah, lots of point. studio guys bought them at the time. Yeah, for sure. And the, the sad thing about the D800 was that it kind of... It kind of killed the D3X a bit because it was 36 megapixels. It was cheaper. Cheaper, smaller, better. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, we, we, we had a colleague, Tony, who worked here and uh, it was me. And we had a discussion about D3X and D800. And Tony was like swearing by D3X and oh, it's amazing camera. And yeah. I said, well, but D800 is cheaper and better. Yeah. So in terms of just technology, and that's to do with the time. I think it was how many? I think it was a couple of years between the two or something uh, like that. So between the D, well, the D810 came out in 2010. Is that right or 12? <laughs> I have to work it backwards. So the 810 came out in 14. Yeah. No, 8, 810 came out in 14. So the 800 came out in 12. Yeah. So it was four years between the D3X and the um, and the 810. If someone would have a search engine where you could type in things and just find out the answer. But you can, but I can't, <laughs> I can't multitask when I've got the comments and the reading yeah. and the thing. By a lot of studio guys bought it for uh, extreme uh, loan, uh, shutter life, uh, for just robustness and the reliability. Um, uh, I had a guy uh, who shot for Argus and John Lewis, and he bought two of them for his studio. Well, there yeah. you go. And there's quite a few people who are saying, okay, Gonna get to your comments now, um, and then I will show you some pictures in a moment. So, um, bought the Nikon system because of the D3. This is Paul. Uh, mm -hmm. Nikon need a mirrorless Halo product again. Okay, seven eight. Oh, sorry, Z eight Z nine needs to be market leading. Okay, so we'll talk, we'll come to that in a minute. Um, <laughs> then Mauro said he uses the D eight ten on full frame. Mm -hmm. um, then also would like to say that the Z line should be a flagship style body doesn't like the body design why mm -hmm. not use the d5 as a uh, base to make yeah let, let's see what's going to come in the future i'm yeah. sure there's some products that are still in development that we'll hear very soon about well not this year but maybe next year we are making some speculations at the end of this <laughs> at the end of this stream remind me um so the d800 d810 as i say kind of took over from the d3x in terms of a high resolution camera you no longer needed to spend five or six grand to buy a studio quality camera a lot of people compared the quality of the d800 and the d810 to medium format cameras mm -hmm. because the files were, were colossal yep. the d850 even more so um i think it was uh, about 70 megabytes 14 bit uncompressed yeah that, that was pretty good at the time you really had to have a beefy computer with a lot of ram to be able to process those files quickly yeah and there was plenty of plenty of caveats to using that much resolution you suddenly needed much better glass you couldn't use your glass from like 20 years ago and expect it to be pin sharp because suddenly the sensor was demanding so much from the camera even the d3x that was the case i did mm -hmm. find some people and also the need for fine tuning became more apparent yeah with those higher resolution sensors so that's true um the d3x was kind of i would say the the not the acid test but it was almost like nikon saying okay we've done this how did it go it went really well okay four years later let's produce a camera that um, is a bit more consumer friendly. For the masses. Yeah, exactly. A camera for the masses. Um, but we're not talking about D810s and D800s today. We're talking about flagship bodies. Yeah, so, we um, may have a whole stream on this. Yeah, yeah. I think we did one, didn't we? Maybe we need to do it again. Yes. Uh, so, yes. So the D4 came out in 2012. Uh, so the D4 was a 16 megapixel sensor. 16. And that's where we saw the XP3 processor, which kept us going for quite a long time. XP3 mm -hmm. was the, the processor in a lot of Nikon's bodies. So new um, processor, better, mm -hmm. higher resolution, yeah. uh, new battery. 
Yes, new battery and much better low light performance. That and again, the AF system was improved as well. And the AF system was dramatically improved. The D4 and the D4S, again, so the D4S came out two years later in 2014. But again, it was small, mm -hmm. I would say, incremental improvements. A lot of people didn't upgrade, I think, from the mm -hmm. D. In fact, some people tend to skip a few generations. Yeah. Like they'll have a D3 and then they'll wait two cameras and then yeah. they'll go for D4S, for example, yeah. or D3S to D4S. I think at this point of the whole camera development, we came to the point where the technology was so good that yeah. with the new releases, we saw kind of more incremental updates than the huge leaps. Yeah. And that's to do with actual quality. They achieved the quality that was kind of surpassable film in terms of, you know, convenience. Yeah. Well, image quality is arguable, of course, but uh, mm. in terms of that, you wouldn't need to upgrade every two years to stay competitive. At this point, you could have your camera for maybe another five, six years before by a new camera and seeing a bigger leap in terms of technology advancement. Yeah, exactly. And um, I... Oh, I didn't show your pictures from the D3. Oh, so Are they D3. on your website? Yeah, let's go back one page. Uh, yeah, they can't Not see this. my work. Uh, other sorry. Work. <laughs> <laughs> just watch me navigate right, if you go to Casa, which this is the one. second one yeah okay so let me flip the screen for you and then you can yeah. see here we go so so that was done for another restaurant and i the the interesting bit about this work that a lot of these images were done uh without any flash so using lower light mm. and using fairly high isos and that's something that i wasn't able to do let's say with d2x no for sure you would have yeah. been a bit stuffed in this shoot if you had not used the d3 <laughs> So this was D3 or D3S? D3. Right, okay. And you know, one thing that I found, the D3, D3S colours were very different to the mm -hmm. D4, D4S colours. That's true. Um, obviously, that has a lot to do with the yeah. sensor, but also just the um, the the processor dealt yeah. with these files very differently. I think this uh, shot of Hamon lag was at about 6400 ISO. Wow, you wouldn't notice yeah. it necessarily, would you? I've got some shot with the D4 uh, D yeah, I think mm -hmm. D4 or D4S at about that ISO, mm -hmm. and um, and you can't really tell. Yeah. I will show those in a minute. Oh, lovely. Optical. Yeah. The whole thing about that shoot was actually we didn't have any book time. They said just come in. We're preparing for the um for the lunch. Mm. So just take shots as as many as you can. Uh, and you know we're not gonna set. You don't have time to set up the lighting or anything. So I literally had to run around and just trying to find different angles. So as you can see, the the chefs are preparing the food. I really like that shot, that action yeah. shot. Actually, I'm mm. not so keen on the big fish. But this, <laughs> <laughs> it looks very sad and dead. It is. Um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, but this is great actually, and it yeah. is very much like in the moment yeah. sort of thing. Um, so then in contrast, so that's D3. Mm -hmm. So over here, now mine, unfortunately, are not in any kind of sequence, of course, but this is D4. Mm -hmm. I need to agree to the cookies on my own website. Um, <laughs> this is D4 at 6400 ISO. So with with this, I don't know if I really want to blow up. I can a bit. And obviously I was using, I was using 85 or 44 yeah. when I was shooting wide open because I just wanted it. It was a concert that I just happened to sneak around. Mm -hmm. Next um, time get a dust in, just wipe the... <laughs> no, I wanted piece. every motor <laughs> dust in the picture. Um, but in comparison, okay, so these shots were done with the D5, which mm -hmm. we will also talk about in a minute. But mm. D5, okay, so fine. I had studio lighting, didn't have to shoot at super high ISOs a lot of the yeah. time. A bit of creating lighting system. Create, yeah, up. but yes. exactly. That's when the SB5000 came out, actually. Mm -hmm. That is a picture of a bassoon read for anyone who doesn't know what that is. I still don't know what <laughs> that is. Still don't know what that is. It goes on the end of a bassoon. I love jazz. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let me flip over from the... There we go. We're back to the yeah. D5 shot. This um, is very Joe McNally type. Of yeah, shot. exactly. I was um, channeling my inner Joe for this one, for this shoot um, of a ballet dancer. Again, this was creative lighting system. Let me just find the wedding that I did. Oh, these. OK, so in terms of concerts, these this was in St. James Piccadilly. Mm -hmm. oh, it was just St. James Piccadilly with a D4 and zero light. So you can see how you can actually see it. Mm -hmm. apart. This was also... 70s 200 plus no sorry 182.8 demons mm. cropped to get and what they saw do you think it is uh, like that was it's two yeah 30, yeah 64 no. it was 60 no it was higher than that it was 8,000. <sighs> i remember because i was sweating <laughs> with like how am i going to get this shot because you couldn't use flash as you probably know if you've ever gone to a classical concert you you're not allowed to really do anything and the sound that was a bench unveiling it was actually d750 that one here we go some wedding shots um 
with classical concerts, you can the sound of the shutter will mm -hmm. reverberate in a hall like that. So you get evil eyes from the people in the audience if you make too much noise. So the D4S had this ability to screen grab from live view. Do you remember oh, okay. it was the first one that it, shot silent? It, yeah, that's that's what we would call silent shooting silent nowadays, shooting isn't it? Now, yeah. which you can do full re full res, but I couldn't obviously do that at the time at the mm. time it was a screen grab and it was like five megapixels mm -hmm, or something. Mm -hmm. so some of those were screen grabs essentially they were silent shooting mode on the d4s um and then you know i use the d4s for um a couple of weddings again wasn't allowed to use flash because everything was ancient and it wasn't allowed um <laughs> so mm. uh so i had to just kind of go with the natural light wherever possible mm -hmm. and um yeah, i think it d4s yeah it's a nicely. really good job um, my website isn't as organized as yours, unfortunately. So it's kind of like everything is all over the place. <laughs> um, so I think your life is better organized than mine. <laughs> yeah, my website's not, but my life is more organized. Okay. All right. So D4 sensor was a game changer for low light shooting. Yeah, I would say exactly. I was going to say uh, this is Woody saying that the, it was the best part of the DF. The D4 sensor was what they put into the DF, which gave it that kind of sweet spot sensor. Um, I've got a few shots from the DF on my own website as well, but um, it just, the low light performance on that was so good, but it also meant that you could shoot with those older manual focus lenses and the image quality wouldn't just fall apart. True. I would say. Um, XT Pot, love your handle, um, used, uh, used D4S versus D780. Which do you like? The D4S is a bit cheaper. I love the 16 megapixel sensor and the body of the D4S, but very curious about the D780 sensor and autofocus. I have an answer. What's your answer? <laughs> uh, I would say autofocus is about the same on both. Um, D4S definitely would feel nice in hand. D780 has a better technology in it. Yeah, and then in terms of the um, live view capabilities, the D780 is a hybrid kind of mirrorless system autofocus. So it's it, the best live view DSLR yeah. from Nikon. So if you're going to yeah. do what I did and shoot concerts in live view with silent shooting mode, definitely the D780 is better equipped for that. The D4S, as I say, the screen grabs essentially is what they were, were super compressed files. You couldn't do much with them after that. So everything kind of gets a bit noisy and, and falls apart. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. XT pot. <laughs> um, now, I've used the big body Nikons. This is Yan. I've used the uh, big body Nikons from the F through F2, F3, F4, F5, D1, X, D2, X, now D850. It's all about the glass. Well, that's fair. You know, you've got that's an informed opinion, I would say. Yeah, she's got them all. I had them all, and it, it is all about the glass. The glass is fantastic, but yeah. there are limitations to what you can shoot, I would say. Like the the shot that the shoot that I did. Yeah with that concert with the D4S would have been a hundred times easier with a D5. Yeah, that's the thing. It and changed my life. <laughs> and I would say that, let's say something that, let's say you could shoot with D1 with the same glass, you would definitely get a better shot shooting, let's say with D5 nowadays and the same glass. And that's just to do with it, the way technology and sense technology has improved yeah. more than anything else. Yeah. Exactly. Nick says the Z6 is ideal for classical concert shooting. Yes, see Here now, we go. when we can do concerts again, and I get called back for concert shooting, I'll be using my Z6 um, alongside the D850. I The wedding, the shots that I showed you were from the D4S on that wedding, but I also shot with the D850. Um, so Sam, I agree, the silent shooting is fantastic. Uh, so we got as far as D4, D4S, and then we have D5. D5, so yes. D5 came out in 2016, and obviously, Everything was bigger, better. Um, D5 was, I um, don't know why I'm looking at my paper because it's <laughs> not written there, it was 20 megapixels. <laughs> I know that. Yeah. Again, bump in resolution. <laughs> yeah, and it was also X Speed 5. X Speed 5. Um, which was, I would say, again, a revolution for low light performance. Yeah. And um, also low light focusing yeah. performance. Autofocus speed overall. Yeah, because it had a yeah. second processor for autofocus, didn't it? Yeah. Like the yeah. Z6 II and Z7 II do now. And a lot of people say, well, 16 and 20 megapixels, it's not a big jump, so what's the difference? Is? And yeah. all we had, we just basically gave them 24 to 70. Mm. They put on 20, D4S and then they put on D5, yeah. and you can see a difference straight away. I mean, yeah, sure. we're talking about, let's say, one will take sec a second, another one take, like, let's say, less than half of a second. But it would be noticeable to the eye how quick it is. And for people shooting events, it's so weddings primarily in the kind of very poor lit areas, mm -hmm. uh, that would make a lot of difference. Yeah. And also for wildlife, because of yeah. course you, you have situations where you're sitting there in a 
maybe in a hide or outdoors for a long period of time to get the right shot, if your autofocus fails you at that point, what there's nothing you can do to recover that shot. So having a, a tool that you can rely on obviously makes a lot of sense. The um the D6, we've done a whole we've done a couple of streams on the D6, have we not? Or certainly one. No, we still have a plan to shoot a D6 review video. Yeah, one day. <laughs> one, one day, day when we'll we get a that. demo unit of yeah, D6. Yeah, we haven't but this is the kind of camera that we don't put on demo at the moment, not until we're sort of open officially and people want to come in and try it out. But certainly comparing the D6 uh with the D5 and also trying out all those autofocus yeah. consider com sorry configurations I think would be quite quite interesting. Yeah. And D6 was a very polarizing camera when it was first announced. Remember yeah. our video? Yeah. <laughs> Yes, I do. We got slammed on the, <laughs> you know, by the internet uh, oh, people. So um, <laughs> it was interesting because I think, well, let's say D5 was still a camera that a lot of people considered, let's say, uh, to put along with the 800 series when D6 came out and became a very niche product where yeah. for sports and wildlife photography, obviously the mirror system has been out at that point. Yeah. And a lot of people kind of decide to switch, kind of, you know, jump yeah. the bug. And They're then, like, you know, okay, they, I'm yeah. done with DSLRs. Yeah. I'm going for a Z camera now. And then Nick, I'm yeah. like, but D6. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> D6 is such a niche product. It's yeah. it's really kind of designed for sports and wildlife stars who need this extra little bit of performance, this yeah. extra percent that you're going to sp spend a lot of money for. Yeah. But what we saw is the main problem is again autofocus speed, and D5 is already very fast. Yeah. With D6, we start to see the pattern focus implements where you could have a square rectangle type of focus or kind of a line type of focus. Or like a T shaped or a T shape. You can, you yeah, you can spell your name with those dots. Um, <laughs> I don't but, think you'd want to yeah. do that. But it was very polarizing the camera at the time, yeah. and obviously uh, the internet is a very interesting uh, place <laughs> it's where. A very uh, strange place. Yeah. <laughs> and obviously, yeah. it upset a lot of people that it yeah. didn't have. A different sensor or yeah. that it didn't have um the hybrid autofocus system that the 780 had yeah. were, it was an interesting camera in terms of the choice of specs i would say but yeah. nikon had a very specific target audience in mind for that one and for those people like i've spoken to joe uh mcnally i've spoken to moose peterson and you know they say obviously the zeds are there for one purpose the d6 is very much it has a photographer in mind, a yeah. particular type of photographer in mind. So if you look at those, if you look at the spec sheet yeah. or if you look at the results and you go, eh, it's no big deal, then it's probably not a camera for you. It would yeah. be like, look at the D5. It's a great camera. From feedback that we got from working professional photographers, yeah. uh, they said that, yes, if that's the features that you need, it's a fantastic camera for that, yeah. but it's not for everyone. No, exactly. Um, so that's where that brings us from D1 all the way up to D6. Um, it's slightly more than 20 years. It's 21, almost 22 years of, of development, but, uh, oh, it, big deal. Oh, yeah. oh, thank you. <laughs> but 20 years had more of a ring to it. <laughs> so we thought we'd go with 20 years off. Um, and, uh, that leads us to D7 that will be announced tomorrow. <laughs> um, so just in terms of speculation, a lot of people have been talking about the Z8 and Z9. Um, we do suspect that something will yeah. turn up. Do you think they will ever replace D6? Or is that what we're going to see kind of shift from D6 to, let's say, Z8 or Z9? I mean, the D6 is only if... Okay, let's, let's speculate here. So if the Z8 slash Z9 comes out in February... I'm guessing February because that's usually when the big announcements mm -hmm. happen, right? Or January. Mm -hmm. Um... So let's say that that happens then. The D6 is then only have, going to have been a year old. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it will uh, replace it. But what the features are going to be, I'm hoping, will kind of mirror that of the D6 mm -hmm. in terms of focusing capabilities. Um, and also, I mean, the low light performance is already very good on the Z yeah. cameras. It would be lovely if it was better. The mm -hmm. low light autofocus performance. I think that the Z6 II and the Z7 II have kind of proven that mm -hmm. These things can be improved. Yes. So why not put them in a flagship body with a bigger grip yeah. and all that kind of stuff, more robust, etc. So let's say Z9 really has to be a kind of um, a leader in yeah. its field. Yeah. And uh, the main thing, I think what kind of the most challenging thing for mirrorless systems at the moment is the autofocus speed. Yeah, for sure. So if they can crack that, if they can put this like very fast, or at least like online with D5 and D6 focusing speed, then the sensor is there. They use the same sensor. Then you put um, stabilization on mm -hmm. the sensor, mm -hmm. make it bigger. So with a 
bigger grip, so yeah, for people exactly. with big hands, and you know, longer battery life. Longer battery life, uh, and that I think would that what Z9 has to be really. Yeah, exactly. Um, bearing in mind that the D6, a lot of people have commented and asked this question. Yes, the D6 was an Olympics camera. Usually, these bodies, flagship bodies, come out. In... You mean the one that were cancelled? Yeah, Olympics. the yeah, Olympics okay. that was cancelled. Exactly. So the D5 was an Olympics camera, as were the D4s. Yeah. You know, they they've always brought them out right before a, a big Olympics. Yeah. Reuters or... bought a bunch of D5s, I think, and D6 at the time. Gators yeah. were buying those cameras yeah. uh, specifically for their photographers. Exactly. So um, if we have a 2021 Olympics, yeah. which is the plan, then we would suspect that maybe mm -hmm. there will be uh, a full frame yeah. body to go along with Actually, that. one thing we didn't mention is the LAN port on those cameras. So oh, you yeah? could actually tether it to the to your laptop and you would send out the images straight to your laptop and they would be uploaded via either well wireless networks mm -hmm. or let's say 3G or 4G networks straight to the agency. That would be quickly edited and uploaded straight online uh, for the newspapers to use. And again, with these type of things, every second counts. So yeah, to have sure. the LAN port is much better than say sending the images wirelessly it's the same as for example you can't see it in frame but um just behind constantine we've got i think 16 d5 boxes um these d5s are actually used in robots for the side of football pitches or in film studios because you needed to be able to directly wire to, can you zoom out a little yeah. bit and just <laughs> yeah. without completely upsetting the frame it would just be interesting to to see can you see it? Yeah. So that is a tower of D5 boxes. There you go. And the, um, I think they got it. <laughs> wow. There's some 70s zoom in there. <laughs> so smooth. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so the, the robotics company actually had D5s in their robots for, um, instant transmission from the robots to their um, sort of uh, press desks, if you like, mm -hmm. where they could immediately edit and also they could remote control the cameras, which was kind of awesome. So um, they've now switched over to D6s and Z6s and Z62s, um, which is why we've got so many D5s. So if you want to bargain on a D5, <laughs> you know where to come. Um, but anyway, it's just, you can't just come a point in. of interest. You can't come in, actually. No, you know cool. where to um, visit online. <laughs> Lots of people speculating about the specs on the on the Z8 and, and stuff. I don't think I can comment on those because I have no idea. But I would say... Yeah, we can't spill all the beans. No, Not yet. We don't have all the beans to spill. <laughs> let's be honest. Um, <laughs> but, mean you can't spill the beans if you don't have them. That's right. Yeah. So the D500, someone asked if they'll ever replace it. I personally, and this is my personal point of view, this has got no connection with Nikon whatsoever. So it was a D500? D500, so, okay. yeah. But I'm thinking that the D6 will probably be their last mm -hmm. flagship body. And certainly I don't foresee any pro level cameras not being mirrorless in the future. Mm -hmm. That's my viewpoint. I do think that they will continue with the small um, consumer cameras for mm -hmm. a little bit. Mm -hmm. Unless... That's what I think. Unless they bring out a Z... 30, let's 35. say. 35. Or, yeah, exactly. 42 and a half. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 42 and three quarters. Because yeah. um, if they bring out a small ZDX camera, then that will kind yeah. of level the playing field a little bit on the entry level cameras. The D3500 is do not let con spill anything, Sam says. <laughs> no spilling. <laughs> Don't. I can't. Ah. Um, the D3500 and D5600, but specifically the 3500 is Nikon's most sold camera yeah, of all their bodies. The most popular camera, absolutely. The, definitely that line of cameras um, is for them the one that they mm -hmm. sell the most units of, let's say. I think we're going to see D850 upgrade. In I a DSLR? In DSLR. Like a hybrid, like a 780? But 780 a hybrid, maybe bigger sensor. Ooh. Well, not bigger physically, but higher resolution, maybe 60 megapixel. Sony sensor that's you know that would um, be kind of cool actually but yeah place place the bets mm -hmm. yeah I think D6 is probably the last flagship DSLR yeah I think so too if if the Z8 slash 9 whatever it's going to be next year it has all the things that we think it's going to have then then that could actually work out yeah. really well it is unfortunate it is unfortunate but that's just the way technology goes yeah um and we all said about that but it seems like in five ten years we will all be using mirrorless cameras yeah exactly i mean nick points out the z62 sounds like as much as he would need i'm much of the same like i wouldn't look at a flagship body i don't need one z62 could now if i had a z62 alongside my z6 i'd easily be able to do all mm -hmm. the weddings concerts and you know just the general mm -hmm. landscape and macro shots that i do 
um, there will be some people that will need the performance of a flagship body. Yeah, and for me, G850 is still the best camera you can ever make. Yeah, it's a, it's a, a beautiful camera. So there we go. That's um, that's my take on that anyway. But <laughs> I'm not going to say that that's set in stone because they could complete. You know, they could announce something else tomorrow, yeah. and we wouldn't know about it. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Um, so I think I've answered all the questions as I've been tracking along. I'm glad that I managed to say Jan's name right because he would be very happy with that. Okay, are um, we doing the giveaway? We're going to do the giveaway, yes. I think. So Some um, goodies. 180 <laughs> grams of warmth. <laughs> 180 yeah. grams of warmth. Well, you've got to have a record player. That's right. Yeah. It's and like you've got to tell me which one you have. It's like a hug. Okay, I'm going to... Um, yeah. Can I do the honours? Yeah, so um, while you're doing this record player, then your speakers and your preamp okay let me know ah it's joy whitehead well done joy. well done you get to win that one joy is a regular viewer on the show thank you to everybody who entered joy i think i've got your details but if you just want to confirm your contact details by email drop an email over to me at info at grazewestminster.com and we'll Hope get you your uh, record sent yeah. out to you in the meantime, you can listen on Spotify. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It's not the same, though, is it's it? It's not the same. It's not the same. Um, anyway, I am very, very glad that we did this live stream. I know it was yeah. a little bit of like, it was a bit of nostalgia, a bit of a trip down memory lane, but it was quite we fun. Cried. <laughs> and we cried. We laughed, we cried. Um, I really hope that, that you found that useful. For anyone who was asking us to do a stream on the earlier bodies, we've kind of covered them all in one go. Um, did you want to say something? We're going to give away every Friday. Ooh, we'd like to. Oh, <laughs> every wants Friday. To some giveaways, we should. I mean, my vinyl collection is very large. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't want to give it all away. Yes. Um, I will also say, talking of giveaways, um, Analog Wonderland, oh, this is an unsponsored plug, but 12 months ago, I got in touch with Analog Wonderland because I was looking for a medium format camera. And I happened to contact Paul, who is one of the co-founders, and said, Paul, I need help with a medium format camera. What should I get? And he, we were talking about various different things. And Holgers came up in the conversation. Mm -hmm. They're like little plasticky um, 120mm cameras, which are very inexpensive because I'd seen how expensive medium format cameras were online. And I was like... <laughs> don't want to spend that kind of money mm -hmm. on it right now um anyway 12 months later and um a you know lot has happened since then yeah. in and the a post package shows up and a package shows up and inside is a whole guy i didn't bring it but imagine it's here it's upstairs um so thank you to paul very mm. very much for sending me that he said 12 months on you know this was a conversation <laughs> i couldn't believe first of all that he remembered yeah. but also that he sent me one so, so i've got holger it. and you've got holger so we maybe should the next, like a shootout we should yeah. we yeah. should it's got nothing to do with nikon but it would be quite fun um and then we can try and develop it ourselves and yeah. see what happens <laughs> it'd be like british bake-off that's right with 124 <laughs> cameras <laughs> Um, so Con can give away a Technics turntable next time. No, I can't do turntables. Wow. Uh, I'm not getting paid that much, but um... <laughs> if you've got any ideas for giveaways, or if you're if you know of a company that wants to give something away, then yeah, we can do that on live stream. I'll also find yeah. some photography books and stuff. That yeah, but you can give away a boys band vinyls. Boy. Um, I'm gonna stick to jazz. Now, now. <laughs> Don't diss the boy bands. Right. So um, I think that pretty much covers everything, doesn't yeah. it? We've, well, we've done yeah, our bit. Yeah, absolutely. Thank so, you so much for joining thank us. Thank you very, very much for joining us and for all your contributions to the Coffee Fund. We will see you next Friday. We will be here for another live stream. Never fear. We are in the shop. And if you need to order anything or have any questions, you can still email us. You can still shop online and you can still telephone the shop. So we haven't vanished. Um, Con, you must not fill, spill the fixer when we do our... Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's a difficult one at university when i started they used to have like a big container so yeah. they weren't small so you just dump the whole thing and it's yeah. just stay there so there was nowhere to spill things <laughs> with little things i you know you. i have a butt of fingers so i i can't really you know like look look it's, no it's, yeah don't it's, don't it's, i can't do that <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right brilliant have a wonderful weekend and week everybody and we will see you yeah. next week for another stream stay safe bye, bye.